Good day. My name is Marlene Bell. I am an assistant director of nursing currently working in a 334-bedded hospital in Saudi Arabia. I would like to thank Dr. Khaled Swafi for allowing me to share a nursing view when preparing for an influx of COVID-19 cases. While 2020 has been a commemorative year for nursing, it has also seen nursing face a global crisis. It is as yet not known how many healthcare workers have died from contracting COVID-19, but the impact it has had and will continue to have on the nursing profession will be enormous in years to come, as less young people choose it as a career due to the perceived risks. One of the biggest challenges facing healthcare workers is that there is still not an established cure or vaccine with which to combat it effectively and only with lockdowns and social distancing have numbers been curtailed. However, thanks to the wealth of shared information, it is possible to identify some common risks. These are the lack of skilled nursing personnel, a lack of traditional critical care beds, an increased risk for staff to contract the infection, mental health and low morale issues on our frontline nurses, and a lack of required critical care equipment and medical supplies to meet demands. Firstly, the shortage of available critical care nurses may be related to the sheer influx of patients who require intensive care services within a short space of time. Staff may be undergoing quarantine or have fallen ill themselves, resulting in extended sick leave. And staff who are considered at high risk would have been furloughed or reassigned to less risky areas. Lastly, travel bans and restrictions remain in place in many countries, thus affecting not only the staff trying to get back, but also any recruitment efforts. Those critical care units are busy already with non-COVID-19 admissions and have good processes already in place to manage the need for beds. This, however, may not be sufficient when there is a sustained rate of admissions and there are no possibilities to transfer patients out. Minimum and maximum stock levels have been developed to prevent the unnecessary wastage due to expired items, as well as to ensure units keep sufficient stocks for daily needs and supply services orders in sufficient quantities based on the consumption. Likewise, with the equipment, which is calculated based on the number of beds and on the average usage. These numbers, however, were not designed to meet any sustained or major surges in consumption and expansion. One of the most striking shortfalls reported has been the lack of suitable PPE, and we have all witnessed the heartbreaking images of healthcare workers struggling to cope with makeshift masks and aprons. Therefore, it is essential a plan is developed to procure and stockpile critical supplies, along with developing a contingency plan to source further supplies for ready access. Healthcare workers working directly with COVID-19 patients are considered to be at high risk for mental issues and depression. This is hardly surprising considering the stress they are dealing with on a daily basis. They are often isolated from family and may be stigmatized and shunned because of their proximity to COVID-19 patients, even by their own colleagues. Fortunately, we are able to benefit from the experiences of the hospitals hardest hit by the COVID-19 outbreak and who pioneered guidelines and strategies which make the best use of all available resources. The following points may be used to discuss the measures available to address an anticipated lack of critical care nurses. Staffing needs should be calculated on a full occupancy basis of all the critical beds in the hospital, irrespective of the original designation. Rarely are all the units full at the same time, and this permits some latitude in the individual units' databases. However, should all the beds be full, with the potential to spill out to the non-critical areas, the critical units will possibly need to look outside their own resources 
in order to fill this gap. Based on the number of beds which are designated for expansion purposes, a contingency plan to support the staffing needs should be designed and prioritised by both nursing administration and education for a speedy rollout. When planning for expanded services, it is important to consider the nurse to patient ratio. While the optimum remains at one nurse to one, this may not be realistic in these circumstances. Therefore, a one nurse to two or even a one nurse to three ratio, providing the patients are not ventilated, may be more feasible. Key staff should be identified early to work in both the critical care units or the expansion wards. The first priority would be those with a critical care background but assigned in other areas. Next would be the units which should be running at minimum capacity due to cancelled electives such as recovery room and the operating room. These staff may require minimal refresher courses or cross-training and then should be able to handle ventilated patients under supervision. The final staffing option should also include medical surgical nurses who may be upskilled to support the critical care nurses. In this way, a nurse to patient ratio of 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 2 may still be attained. Training courses provided by the clinical instructors and education department may be carried out online or offered on the hospital information system. Class lectures should be currently avoided unless numbers are very, very limited. Education should be ongoing and focus on the current priorities, which are infection control practices and COVID-19 specific care and precautions. Cross-training and ICU exposure for those staff who need upskilling should go together with introductory courses featuring mechanical ventilation, central line and arterial line management, and intensive care monitoring. Ongoing monitoring of PPE competencies and infection control standards should be carried out by the senior staff. COVID-19 norms of care, where the policies or guidelines should provide the staff with information about how to safely provide the care to the patient under all the scenarios. Staff may be temporarily reassigned not only to support the critical care areas, but also the departments such as infection control and disaster management in order to provide backup with data collection, tracing and monitoring. Staff working in the designated COVID-19 areas and participating in high-risk procedures such as suctioning and assisting in intubation should be prioritised for ongoing training and frequently monitored to ensure no lapses and safety precautions are occurring. Providing staff with the most up-to-date information is important not only to ensure they remain in the loop, but it also helps keep them connected and engaged even when they are being isolated. The critical care department may have designated one specific unit to receive all COVID-19 confirmed or suspected cases. As the numbers rise, a clear flow process for further patient admission should outline which areas would be used to accept infectious patients, as well as what units would remain solely for the admission of non-infectious. There should not be a mingling of infectious patients with non-infectious in the same unit or ward, and the admission process should not be haphazard. Adding HEPA filter units to selected rooms may help with expansion purposes should there be insufficient negative pressure rooms. However, many procedures routinely performed in the intensive care unit are aerosol producing, so it is recommended that these are performed in a negative pressure room. In preparation for the expansion of critical beds into the general wards, it is ideal to have designated wards all on the same floor. Once again, a clear plan can be developed to guide the flow of patients from area to area as the beds fill up. The initial steps to clear beds both within the critical areas as well as the wards would have been done already, such as cancelling elective cases and external transfers in. However, there will still be patients present due to emergency admissions or the long stays. They should be transferred out to another floor or facility 
or even discharged home under the care of home health care. Once the patient is for discharge or transfer, there should be no delay in shifting the patient out in order to clean and fumigate the room and prepare it for the next patient. Equally, if a patient is negative for COVID-19, he or she should be transferred out immediately in order to release the bed. The issue of availability of crucial supplies is important to the frontline workers, as they and their patients are the most affected by delays. Normal delays in the supplies chain may occur, but in these circumstances could be disastrous. Some stockpiling is recommended providing space and temperature requirements are met. However, the rapid and sustained consumption from COVID-19 cases could deplete even the largest. Therefore, it is prudent for both the hospital and the warehouse to take a complete inventory of supplies and equipment, identify any gaps and act upon it. Daily monitoring of the levels in the units with reorders sent to the supplies should be done before any minimum levels are reached. The hospital leaders should be aware and updated regarding the critical stock levels at all times in case contingency measures are required. Any supplies requests which cannot be met by the purchasing department's normal processes would then trigger a need for alternative sources. The hospital leadership and purchasing should develop alternative sources to procure the unavailable items either through the authorities or any private vendors who can be relied upon to deliver sufficient quantities without delays. Stockpiles of items like PPE and ventilation accessories should be done proactively, but there should also be an agreement in place either through the governing body or again private companies to gain access to these items on a needs basis. Limiting the risk of infection to staff ensures your staffing numbers remain sustainable and it prevents an outbreak to other areas of the hospital. It also provides the staff with the reassurance that their well-being is protected and valued. By limiting the time each staff spends at the bedside of the patient, this reduces the risk of possible infection. Therefore, it is advisable to cluster multiple tasks together to reduce the number of contact minutes and the frequency. The staff should have access to large supplies of PPE, such as N95 masks, face shields, goggles, PAPR, gowns, suits, aprons and hidden foot covers. They should be aware of what scenarios require which PPE items. Single use items should not be reused. And additional PPE should also be made available for use by the non-ventilated patients, such as the HIPAA filter fitted face masks and the surgical masks. Staff numbers on duty should be limited and they should not be encouraged to work additional shifts or extended hours. Social distancing on duty as well as separation between staff who are working in the COVID-19 areas and those who are not is recommended. Staff education and compliancy monitoring to the safe practice of infection control requirements, PPE practice and social distancing should be ongoing while performing care and procedures. Utilising media tools such as Zoom, Webinar, Webex are all useful. However, compliancy should be visual and competencies frequently evaluated. Nurses caring for patients on ventilators, non-invasive ventilation devices or high-flow nasal cannulas are at risk due to the aerosol-producing nature of these devices. Procedures such as suctioning, removal for adjustments to the masks or even just the process of providing high-flow air to a patient carry risks and these should be clearly understood. Using closed circuits with minimal interruptions or changes, face masks on patients with the nasal cannulas, and extra care when prone positioning are just a few of the measures staff must be compliant to. They should be monitored and supported by ensuring adequate supplies and education are readily available. 
Negative pressure areas should be available when performing the high risk procedures. Strict surface decontamination of the ICU is very important to reduce the risks of transmission and non-ventilated patients should also be supplied with the appropriate PPE. Utilizing the buddy system when staff are donning and doffing PPE allows a second experienced person to check the staff are not inadvertently exposed by wrongful practices or by torn and damaged PPE items. Two pairs of eyes are better than one and it will reassure the staff that they are safe in their practice. Hospital and nursing leadership should be visible, available and supportive. Communication should be regular and efforts should be made to support the staff who may express their concerns or fears. Staff should be encouraged to filter all the information online and by the news. Much of this may be overwhelming and only results in increased stress and feelings of hopelessness. Ongoing awareness is important to understand developments, but information from reliable sources should be encouraged and media link support groups can be developed to keep the staff informed and connected. Staff should have access to talk to a trained counsellor and a mental outreach team can be invaluable, both as a support centre or as a means to provide valuable information for the staff. Staff working in the COVID-19 areas may be at risk of being stigmatised and this should be discouraged from the highest level in much the same way bullying and intimidation would be, with reported incidents dealt with immediately. Peer support mechanisms and the buddy system can help with feelings of isolation and staff should be encouraged to remain supportive of each other at all times. Recognise and assist staff with domestic or travel concerns as well as address any difficulties they may be experiencing due to the situation. This may be as simple as providing them with meals or even physically rehousing staff who are concerned about the risk to their families. Staff should be recognised and thanked for their efforts and all concerns or fears should be heard and responded to. Some staff may require more support and are at a higher risk for burnout or severe mental illness. This should be recognised early on by the department heads and immediate interventions taken to assist them. In conclusion, while not all hospital staff will be in the front line or exposed to the risks associated with treating COVID-19 critical patients, it is incumbent on all staff to help provide the tools, skills and support necessary for those staff to perform their duties safely and securing the knowledge that their efforts are recognised and they are not in this alone. Thank you.